Welcome back to the 2H Media stream. We have a great stream doc, as usual, to go through this month. Lots of fantastic articles. Yeah. Some good things happen in the world, some not so good things happen in the world. But that's the news. I'm excited for it, as always. We have some good topics. I like it. Some things that aren't surprising, but we should chat about it. Well, let's kick off with one that's really not surprising. Oh, yes. Telecom Group sues to block FTC's click to cancel rule. Now, this may be surprising if you had no idea what the click to cancel rule is, but if you'd heard about it, finding it that the telecoms, telecoms are suing to cancel it um, is not surprising. No. So, and I believe we chatted about the click to cancel at a previous stream, or we just talked about that off stream? We've talked about that off stream, because that okay. news broke between, uh, between streams. That's um, right. And when putting the stream doc together, I felt it was more appropriate to talk about the latest news yep. on that rather than the initial announcement. So Before you get into it, the FTC has been killing it this year. Yeah. Killing it. So, like... A lot of, like, big government agencies holy. holding tech companies accountable this year, which has been sick. It's, really it's been consumer. wild. Totally the, wild. the fake reviews, the click to cancel, there's yeah. been, like... There's a bunch of, like, EU stuff on, um, like, anti-competitiveness and, like, yeah. app stores and... It's been, um, they've been crushing it. Places. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Let's dive in. This, this article is from Routers um, on October 23rd. An industry group representing cable and internet providers sued, along with two others, on Wednesday to block a U.S. Federal Trade Commission rule that requires companies to offer simple cancellation mechanisms for subscriptions. NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, and groups representing the home security and online advertising industries said in papers filed with the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans that the rule known as click to cancel oversteps the FTC's authority and was not supported by evidence. A spokesperson for the FTC declined to comment. The FTC finalized the rule on October 16th after considering thousands of comments from individuals, industry groups, and consumer advocates. The Electronic Security Association, Interactive Advertising Bureau, and NCTA had filed comments criticizing the rule as overly broad. NCTA represents major cable and internet providers including Charter Communications, CHTRO, uh, Comcast Corp, and Cox Communications, as well as media companies such as Disney Entertainment and Warner Bros. Discovery. The rule requires businesses to get consumers' consent for subscriptions, auto renewals, and free trials that convert to paid memberships. The cancellation method must be at least as easy to use as the sign-up process. It also prohibits requiring consumers who signed up through an app or website to go through a chatbot or agent to cancel. For in-person signups, companies must provide means to cancel by phone or online. The Fifth Circuit is a popular venue for business groups to challenge agency actions. Twelve of the Fifth Circuit's 17 active judges were appointed by a Republican president, including six by former President Donald Trump. And this article is by readers. Um, oh, yeah. is our stream offline? Mm-hmm. That's really weird. Mm-hmm. OBS seems to think we are still streaming. Mm-hmm. It says live, but it says offline. I've done it a couple of times. What did you get that full monologue out first? Uh, that looks like us. Good. Okay. Okay. Just Twitch being weird. Twitch is being weird. All right. Yeah, we'll have to make a cut there. Um, well, that's fine. I thought it was really weird because it, it went and then it turned off and I didn't want to yeah. continue on before checking it. So that was great. So yeah, reading through that, again, it's not surprising that there's going to be um, some lobbyists and some groups um, that are fighting that because, you know, interests are interests. Yeah. Um, to go back, maybe you haven't heard about this, like a little bit of full context here. The FTC put a rule in place uh, not long ago. This is like... This is super recent. Super recent. Now, Last 30 days, maybe. The text we read through in the article did a good job explaining yes. what the law... But the this law. is a recent... This is like 30 days ago they did this. FTC puts the rules in place. And then uh, as of a few days ago, they... They are suing to stop it. Um, and this is this is the normal process. Yes. Right. When like when um, the FTC or the EU or like any organization puts out a new rule restricting what the big corporations can do, they try to fight it. So like we shouldn't be surprised um, that this is being challenged. Yep. Now, what's likely to happen with this rule? That's hard to say. Um, the Fifth Circuit, as the article kind of alluded to, tends to be fairly friendly to corporations. Um, 
you know, this could get appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, depending on how, um, how it goes. far the case goes. Like, it's, uh, you never really know until it gets into the legal system. So we're not going to comment too heavily. No. I do want to ask one studio. question yeah. before we start. What was the most frustrating thing that you've ever signed up for uh, that you were trying to cancel that was the most frustrating to cancel? What was it? Um, Facebook Business Manager. Facebook Business Manager. Which is really funny because we weren't paying for Facebook Business Manager. No. That back end was just so broken that like trying to cancel the account just to get disconnected from everyone else's mm -hmm. businesses uh, when we decided not to offer that service anymore was... That was frustrating. That took years. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah like, that's a good one. That's actually we, were, we weren't even trying to cancel a paid service. So it's not like Facebook was benefiting from how bad this cancellation nope. process was. It was just super broken. So that's the worst one. Um, I've never like I've never been locked into a gym membership or anything though. Um, good. Yeah. I mean, Neither have I. You know, I've got a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to get out of that one might be a little difficult. It's expensive. It's ex <laughs> it, it costs like the value of the house if you want. Yeah, the the remaining value of, that you yeah. owe. Yeah, you just got to pay that up. It's really easy. Yeah. Um, but no, like I haven't had too many trouble with like subscriptions that are hard good. to get out. Of. Now that said. I'm pretty tech savvy, so like for me to wade through customer service channels and figure out how to cancel a subscription mm -hmm. um, is not the most complicated thing in the world. Um, I've had friends who have wanted to get out of subscriptions that were so hard to cancel, they just canceled the credit cards. Cancel the credit card. That's our yeah. rush. And then they waited for people to call them and say, hey, your credit card's expired. And they gave their new credit card information to the services they still wanted to use. Is that the best by the book way to get out of nope. shady subscriptions? No. But you know That's what? a pain in the butt way. It did the job. It'll do it. Um, it will do it. I think it's really sad that the big telecoms are fighting click to cancel. Um, you should. I mean, the discussion topic is how should consumers feel about click to cancel? It it They should feel good about this because um, it should be easy to sign up for something. You should get all the information. We're, again, advocate, big advocates for transparency. You should know how much things cost. You should know thing, how for how long and the frequency and all the important things you should know in order for you to make an informed decision. And then let's just say life changes or Dude, it's uh, like, moving. Great. You, it's, it's a so, no-brainer. It's so much more basic than that. Yeah. You should be selling your goods and services to people that want your goods and services. Mm -hmm. When people don't want your goods and services, they should, should be able to, be to them. <laughs> like, it's, it should be that easy, right? So like if, if people are signing up for things and then they're not enjoying it, they want to get out, um, they it should. should be really straightforward yeah. for them to just disengage from paying for that service. Uh, the worst one of those I ever had actually, going back to your question, was a VPN service that a I signed VPN. up for. Um, I wasn't super happy with it. I found it slow to connect. I was having issues. And like I tried to cancel my account like day one. And it took a bunch of back and forth with their staff, like grilling me on why I wanted to cancel. And I'm just like, because the service isn't good. Why am I here? Get rid of this. Yeah. I shouldn't have to give you any more than I don't want it anymore. Yeah. And that's it, right? Like, um, I, I know, get it's, that. It's weird returning things. When you like, when you buy something and it's like the wrong size of bolt for whatever you're trying to, you know, install in your, in your closet and you're like, Oh, I bought I bought a set, a set of screws that are the wrong size. I need to return these and buy the right size. It's awkward doing that, going to the store and saying like, yeah, I just bought the wrong thing. I need to bring it back. But you know, I've never had trouble doing it. In person returns are pretty easy. Like you know, how many times have I had to return something to like a Home Depot or that's 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 the example. Yeah. They're like they're pretty like, good. They're like, hey, like, you ever see you're Home yeah. Renos? Yeah. You're gonna make it to Home Depot like four times a day because you never get all the right things all the right way on at first once. Visit. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, that, that return process feels awkward, but the company doesn't make it difficult. They just like take your nope. return and then there you go. You're good to go. Like Costco's return policy is famously super, super, oh. super easy to work with. Um, and it's like, if we can make giving back things you've purchased and getting your money that easy, yeah, there's no reason why not paying for a subscription anymore and not getting that service. Now, I, I believe, so on to the next one, how should businesses respond? I believe that the business should be able to capture some information on like, why don't you like this anymore? So that they can make the product better. But that, that act of like, hey, capturing some feedback, it needs to be short and sweet and brief and like great and, and, and friendly. And maybe there was some miscommunication or whatever, but they, they should be able to capture like, why the heck is this? Did we, did we do something? Is there... 
XYZ. It doesn't need to be out the door with no conversation. There's still a person on the other end of this after all. So like, yeah, right. It doesn't need to be yelling and swearing and, you know, but if it was my business, I'd be like, well, what's our biggest churn rate? Why are people not liking? Where can I focus my energy on making people like the thing we make more? Yeah. So yeah, this, the solution for decreasing churn should be improving the service. Yeah. Not trapping customers who are miserable in your ecosystem. Oh, Cause yeah. that's so horrible for everyone horrible. involved. Horrible. Like even as a business owner, the last thing I want is an army of locked in customers that don't want to deal with me. Yeah, just so that you can, yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. it's never going to be worth the money I'm making in. Now, I, I get it if you're a huge telecom and you've got a bunch of outsourced customer service staff dealing with all the complaints and it's just a number to you. Yep. Um, Doesn't that sound like, like you're... It's still not a nice thing to do. It sounds to me like you're not really thinking of the shareholder. Sure. <laughs> So like, you know, for the size of businesses we work with, yes. though, we don't have too many people that are like going to be shaken up over this click to cancel nope. thing. Um, just keep doing what you're doing. Offer good service. Make it easy for people to get into your service and out of your service. And make sure they don't want to leave because you're offering them a really great experience. Yeah. Learn from the things that go wrong and try not to repeat them. And yeah, yeah that's it. Um, what's likely to happen with this rule now that the FC, FTC is being sued? Okay. Like we touched on this one already. It's they get sued all the time. Let's be real. This yeah. is not like a, like Aaron said, this is not like a new thing. I mean, it's surprising. It's just like, yep, yeah, they get sued. They get challenged. It's like, it's a challenge. It's like, yeah. you're, you're doing a thing that we think infringes on our rights. Okay. They're going to, the, the lawyers are going to take it from here and there's going to be some judges that weigh in on it. So great. They're very well, well prepared to do this because they, they put the, the rule in place ahead of time. They could spot this a mile away. Great. Uh, what's likely to happen? It's going to get tied up, probably. Lawyers like making money. Yeah. Judges are and courts are notoriously not quick by nature. That's okay. I we, mean, don't, like, we don't need to be. That's not a complaint. That's just like what it is. There's going to be a bunch of back and forth, and yeah. then either some version of this rule will make it through, yeah. or it'll get repealed. Or it'll get repealed. That's it. And that's it. Um, we're not legal experts no. by any means, so like commenting too heavily on this kind of thing is a challenge. We've kind of covered the business impacts and like what you should and shouldn't do with uh, click to cancel but then like yeah in terms of like getting too speculative on the courts we don't yeah. know we're not lawyers what we are though is technology experts yeah and that leads really nicely into our second topic do you want to read us in? yeah 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 let's do that let's do that Gartner's top 10 strategic technology trends for 2025 can't believe we're thinking about 2025 already but uh, yeah, oh my goodness. Okay, Gartner Inc. announced the top 10 strategic technology trends for 2025 at its IT Symposium Expo in Orlando this week. This year's top strategic technology trend spans AI imperatives and risks, new frontiers of computing and human machine synergy, uh, said Gene Alvarez, distinguished VP uh, analyst at Gartner. These trends can also help technology leaders ensure innovation is both Re, uh, responsible and ethical, he added. The 10 trends Gardner believes will drive disruption and opportunity for IT leaders next year are, and again, these are not numbered, so this is just a list. Agenic AI, AI governance platforms, dif- disinformation security, post quantum cryptography, ambient invisible intelligence, energy efficient computing, hybrid computing, spatial computing, polyfunctional robots, and neurological enhancement. And this is coming from Forbes. Whoa, there are some big words on that list. There sure are. Our uh, our first discussion topic for this for this article is: uh, Do we actually need to know what any of these terms mean? Well, this is. It sounds like this is on the cutting edge of like here's why businesses are going to be investing money. The larger guys are going to be investing money in these in these. Uh, if you're a medium size or smaller business, no. Yeah. No, short answer. No, like great. This does it make for like a fun read if you're like out on the porch, you know, the sun shining. You're gonna read the paper. You're gonna read some articles. Yeah, go ahead, read it. Will it actually impact your business in 2025? It is probably not. Um, if you're curious, the full article from Forbes does explain each of these terms in detail. Yes. Um, but we just stopped after the list because you know this goes back to the conversation we have all the time about chasing shiny objects and really focusing on the right things as a business, most small and medium-sized businesses really shouldn't be chasing the latest and the greatest technologies. Um, If someone comes to your business trying to sell you on 
ambient invisible intelligence, hmm. this is probably way outside the scope of anything at all related to yeah. so where your business is at now, where your business is going. Um, it's buzzworthy. You know, like people are dropping names of technology. It's cringy buzzworthy. Oh, yeah. It's like not even buzzworthy. It's like it's like the worst. Yeah. We went to a, we went to a trade show um, yesterday. We went to the yep. Small Business Summit uh, in Toronto, and it was a really good time. It was great little show. Um, Saw some friends. Yep, met some friends. We ran into some friends. Uh, worked some stuff out with Amazon. Like it was it was a really good, valuable experience for us, and we're, we're going to go back to the next one. Um, but there was a lot of talk at the show about AI. Tons, both at the booths and. Keynotes. Um, keynotes, yeah. Workshops, yeah. Um, I think it's just not there. Why don't you? Why don't you? If you haven't checked this out before, why don't why don't you break down your opinions? Because like, there's like AI and like four of these points. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this in quite a bit of depth. AI, as we know it today, the large language models and like the sorting algorithms and the image creation, it's a very cool tech demo. It has some very cool applications in very niche areas, but in terms of the ways that like small business owners are jumping on it to power up their marketing engines and try to save a bunch of money in creating new assets, um, and the way that it's being pushed to small businesses as the solution to all their problems, it's not there. It's not, it's not going to generate good search engine optimized tech that you can use on your website. It's not going to generate images of your actual products that you can use to populate your online store. Um, it's not going to help you with a strategy. It's not going to help you learn about your competitors. It's not, it, it's fun. Yeah. It's cool. Like, I, again, like we're not trying to gatekeep it. We're not saying, hey, don't, don't touch it and be fearful of it. No, like hop in it, ask it some prompts. And there, cool. are, there are some like, you know, realistic use cases for hopping on one of the free generative AI platforms and having a back and forth, it can be a great brainstorming tool. Yep. If you're not the strongest writer and you're trying to compose content that doesn't have an SEO use, uh, it can be a great way of cleaning up some of your ideas as long as you're going through it and making sure that the information stays accurate. Um, it can summarize things okay. Yeah. Like if you don't want to read a whole thing, it's like, hey, give me the, the top, the, the points that I should get out of here. And yep. Okay, that's okay. So there's like some time savings there. I don't think there's a money making, revenue generating aspect out of it, but like there's, it save you a little bit of time. But like, there's also, there's also like, that's not going to make or break your business. That's yeah. not going to make you, you know, it's not going to add a zero to your revenue next year. It's not going to, we're not there yet. And, and you should be suspicious of anyone trying to pitch you aggressive technology changes in your business based on leveraging generative AI because yeah. um, it's a trend and it's probably not addressing the actual concerns you have yeah. as a business. Focus on your product and your service. Focus on your customer. If your ops are that terrible, you're going to have to find out where you're bleeding money. You're going to have to find out where, you're, where, where your slow points are. And again, like asking a computer to figure out, hey, where can I... Where can I optimize my business? It's not there yet. It's not going to be there for a little while. When it is, we're going to talk about it. I guarantee you when like we actually find a really, really good use for this, we're going to tell you about it oh, and yeah. we're not going to, we're going to go into it. It'll be like, it'll potentially be its own full stream on like, here's a really cool thing that you should be doing right now. Practical application one, two, three. There'll probably be like a tutorial on our YouTube channel about like how to do it. It'll be really cool. We'll do that. Yeah. We can't do that right now because we don't have a good one to actually show you. Um, well, so that brings us nicely to our third discussion topic. So we really covered the first two. Yeah. Um, what technologies should businesses be investing in in 2025? Ooh, that's a good one. And Obviously, it depends on the type of business and that, yeah, it's going to depend on who you're selling to, product versus service or hybrid, D2C, B2C. I think cool. there's a really broad answer to this. Yep. That's widely applicable. Yep. We've been uh, digital technology advisors for years now. Uh, over 2024, 2025, or over 2023, 2024, we did a bunch of digital advisory through uh, Canadian Digital Adoption Program. And there were a lot of businesses we spoke to that had technologies in mind that they knew they would benefit from, but hadn't investigated and had been putting off for years. We're talking basics, work management software, customer relationship managers, password managers, um, you know, e email authentication, real basic nuts and bolts stuff 
that helps a growing business scale smoothly. Not flashy new trends, just proven technologies that larger businesses have been using to scale for years and that you're probably already aware of and just haven't pulled the trigger on. So in terms of where you should be investing in technology in 2025, you can waste a lot of time trying to research all of the latest and the greatest technology trends and figure out a way to force them into your business. Or you can take all that energy and all those resources and you can go back to the technologies that you've been thinking about for a while and you know you probably need it and you just haven't made the investment, whether that's time or money or a combination of the two. Um, so in terms of where people should be focusing in 2025, I think if you're in tune with your business, you probably already know a lot of those answers. And if you don't, it might be a good idea to connect with an agency like ours, do a technology audit, and figure out what technologies your business is leveraging now, how it could be using them more effectively, and then which established and effective technologies can slot into your business ecosystem and help you take things to the next level. We, we might actually, um, which I think would be cool, we might actually um, do a stream on our technology findings from the past two years on sure. what, and we'll break down like our list of the top 10. That would actually be a good idea of our list of the top 10 most reasonable. And the, are they going to be new? Are they going to be cutting edge? No, but they're going to be new for you. Yeah. Not, not these, the, again, these don't have to be, you know, quantum buzzword, effic energy efficient computing. Well, I plug my computer into the wall outlet and that's about as efficient as we get. You should too. So yeah, we, we'll do our own. We'll do our own top ten list. I think that'd be pretty cool. It's really funny. This list comments on a, like a lot of top ten things that are like really, really big picture. Like not a concern yeah. for your average reader. So like the, the energy efficient computing specifically, that's all about like making servers run more effectively, so that the companies offering these AI services yeah. aren't just burning through energy trying to make the programs run. Um, that information is not out there for like small businesses trying to figure out next steps. That information is out there for investors trying to assess, you know, what's going on with these big companies. Um, and there's a lot of companies putting out information that seems to be more like investor driven rather than consumer driven. Um, yeah. And that again bridges us into our next uh, our next article. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I will read us into. Columbia appoints new creative agency and hires new head of marketing to lead creative strategy forward. Portland, Oregon, Columbia Sportswear Company, a global leader in designing, sourcing, marketing, and distributing outdoor apparel, footwear, accessories, and equipment products, today announced that the Columbia brand has a new creative agency partner and marketing leadership to oversee the brand's new creative strategy the approach will lean into the 86-year-old company's unique character to elevate the Columbia brand. These changes are part of the brand's forward-looking strategic brand vision that will pair product strategy with integrated marketing to meet consumers where they are to drive more meaningful brand experiences. Which is about the buzzwordiest paragraph I have read <laughs> on this stream today. We're going to come back to that. Uh, Joe Boyle, Executive Vice President, Columbia Brand President, said, We've built an extraordinary outdoor brand that set the standard for excellence worldwide. The past year, we've been retooling and reshaping our business to scale new heights. In the year ahead, you'll see the Columbia brand roll out a product strategy that is deeply intertwined with marketing allowing us to reach consumers in new, surprising ways to reintroduce our iconic brand. To lead the creative direction forward, the Columbia brand appointed Adam and Eve DVB as its global agency of record, following a competitive pitch against several undisclosed global agencies. The global account will be led by Adam and Eve DVB London in close partnership with its New York and San Francisco offices. Miranda Hipwell, CEO of Adam and EDB, added, The story of Columbia is so rich and full of personality. This was a partnership we felt excited about from the moment Joe's letter inviting us to pitch landed on our desks. We've enjoyed every minute of the journey until now and can't wait to tell more people all over the world about the unique marriage of irreverence, imagination, and innovation embedded in the brand's DNA. In a world full of purpose-led ambitions, Columbia is a rare example of the real deal. 
We couldn't be happier to be kicking off this creative collaborative partnership. And this uh, article came from the Financial Post. Um, so fun stuff. Yeah, fun stuff. I own a bunch of Columbia stuff. We've been buying it for years. It's a good brand. Um, I can't tell you. Oh, I'm going to cut back to the first the first paragraph here, in which uh, uh, a part of the discussion topic one is: Do consumers want to be reached in new surprising ways? Uh, coming right back to what to what you said, the changes are part of a brand's forward-looking strategic brand vision that will pair product strategy with integrated marketing to meet consumers where they are and drive more meaningful brand experiences. Um, do consumers want to be reached in new surprising ways? Hmm. Hmm. No. <laughs> uh, I don't like it when I'm watching a TV show and it's surprise commercial time. Yeah. I don't like surprises. Consumers don't like, and that's not a good surprise. If you're going to like, if I'm going to get a pair of boots and it comes with like a, a pair of socks, that's a great surprise. And then maybe they introduce their new thermo sock brand by including a yeah okay great that'll be that'll be sweet i would love that added value is sweet uh marketing is a real tough job when you're trying to add value to awareness without without yeah without it seeming really 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 commercial it's very funny when marketing agencies try to market the concept of marketing in really (laughs) abstract ways yeah right yes like at, at its core Effective marketing is really transactional. We're trying to get information to people that will be excited by that information. Yeah. And there's lots of ways we can go about doing that. You know, when we talk about digital advertising, we're specifically looking for people that are in market and we're trying to make it easier for them when they are looking for a product or service to find the product or service we're promoting. Yes. There's there's nothing like mystical about that. It's a technical process. You need to understand how the ads work really well. You need to understand your targeting. You need to understand your market. You need to understand if your product even makes sense to pitch to people in market, or if your product is so new and innovative that you need to just raise awareness and make people know that your thing even exists in the first place so they can seek it out. But none of that involves like... Surprising ways of connecting with consumers. Like, whoa! Surprise ad! Whoa! There's like 40,000 influencers yeah. all shilling Columbia stuff. It's like, huh. It's like, okay. They got good stuff. I've had, again, they, they, there, there are, there are opportunities to say, how do I, how do I communicate my brand value? How do I show you that this equipment is good? How do I show you that we're better than our competitors? How do I show you that we're making commitments to the environment? How, how do I, how do I, how do I, all of that. So like, there's tons and tons of ways about communicating why we're good and why you should care. And, and all of those things and, and you know cool like it's just not surprising ways um, the, the there's there's a lot of jargon in this yeah there's a lot of jargon cool there's there's a lot of like buzzwordy like marketing yeah. nothing in there like when you describe elements of a brand identity as being embedded in its DNA that is such a like marketer term they're ta- they're a marketer talking to other marketers and execs just like trying to get everyone excited about how dynamic yeah it's like a finger guns moment um you were doing it subliminally i'm like i'll get you i'll get you in it it's like like, that's it Um, we've been in these rooms it's like it's like that is let's just cut through that with a hot knife yeah uh let's get back down to like and like some of it's genuine they're not presenting it very genuinely but like yes when you start working with a company that has a really established identity and they're actually about something and Mm -hmm. they have values and they have a history and they have a story to tell that is much more fun to market than a company that is like drop shipping widgets or like brand new with like no history we can't do any callbacks we like there's there's no there's no successes we can build on like when there's well, and like you know maybe they're brand new but they're a scrappy underdog with like oh, a big goal love those that can be a lot of fun yeah um, very we, fun we worked with um, a watch company a few years ago where they were raising awareness for mental health and they were super passionate yep. about all of the work they were doing and it was really fun creating content with them because they had things to share that they were genuinely passionate yeah about. meaningful things to share there was no surprises. There, there was learnings. There was teachings. It made you think about time differently, yeah. which is okay, great. But uh, you know, you're not trying to. You gotta. 
I'm not sure if it was in this article or another one. It's like you got to meet the consumer where they are. Yep, that's definitely that was fun. it. That, there, there were some it. gems in here. Yeah, that were like, like, that's buried in some of the buzzwords. We say that all the time. You got to meet them where they are. If they're not ready to purchase yet, like we're, yeah. we're, airlines do that really well. Yeah, it's like you're not ready for a trip until you're ready for a trip and. Great. So uh, the second discussion topic, what does it mean for a product strategy to be deeply intertwined with the marketing? Yeah. That's actually a super important nugget that's just like kind yeah. of glossed over in the article. Yeah. Um, having a product strategy entwined with your marketing is a godsend for your marketing department. You wouldn't believe how often as your marketing agency, we are the last people to find out about a new product that you want to market. And when you come to your marketing agency last, you have missed out on months and months and months of opportunities to build hype and prepare for aggressive and successful marketing early in your product launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have like, some people say oh, mar- product should lead marketing or marketing should lead product. Really, it's got to be intertwined. It's it's like it's like chicken and egg. Like, if no one knows about your product, it's gonna fail. Yeah. And if everyone knows about your product, but the product doesn't like actually mean anything to them, it's gonna fail as well. So, this could be as simple as saying, hey, when we're talking about product, when we're making decisions on development or sourcing or you know color launch, like anything. Someone from the marketing team needs to be in there, go in that in that conversation. Whether they're taking notes or influencing things, it's like okay, great, we're coming out with something as trivial as like, great, we're doing co- new colors for 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 Halloween. Yeah. Well, well, great. What what do you think we can do? That that's marketing's job. Now we we'll get creative around that. But if they're the last dog at the bowl, they're not doing anything. This isn't going to go well. Now we've just got a bunch of orange and black, and that's that's fine and all. But and then even more than that, it's. Marketing gets a lot of information back from the consumers that should go back to feed product strategy to create that loop of going, yeah. hey, great, the noodle loop, great, we, we gotta go and we gotta go and like capture feedback, implement the feedback, and then test again, and then launch, and then that cycle is gonna go over and over and over and over and over. And the better, the more entwined and the faster that cycle goes, that better that product's gonna be oh, yeah. for sure, like hands down, easy. This is especially true of brand new products and brand new businesses. We talk to a lot of startups who have done nothing to document the process of going to launch. Yeah. And there are so many opportunities from a social media perspective to share your story and share the process of getting ready for your first product launch or your grand opening and build a following that feels engaged in your journey so that when you're ready to launch, they're ready and waiting and they're excited. Yeah. You can build, you can build all kinds of things ahead of time, even before the product's ready to be sold. I can, there's like, it's just interest. Can I generate interest? I don't even have to, to generate a dollar or a like or a follow or anything. It's just like, Hey, can, would you be interested in this thing? Well, people, well there's tons of people that are interested in all kinds of things. And especially when you've got a brand that's like closing in on a hundred years old, they got all kinds of stuff to share. Yeah. All kinds, whether it's new technology that they're integrating into you know their coats or their socks or their shoes or their their great like let's see it let's let's see it not only do they look good it's lighter weight or that they're doing an it's gonna be fun this is this is a job where um the company does have some very good strong brand values already good product and now they've kind of set the marketing agency the creative agency up for success already just by having those things where they don't need to embellish they don't need to yeah they, they need to have fun now and it's kind of a, a sweet uh, like so Miranda there they're gonna have a pretty sweet job of, of doing this now it's up for them to execute on it and and who's to say but that's like they are poised for some cool stuff like that's yeah so all that being said they've got great stuff to share why are they sharing this why is this news uh, this is like this is our last discussion topic on this article why did big businesses announce their marketing moves oh all kinds of reasons and if there's good reasons for it should small businesses be doing so, the same thing? So, so with this case in particular, they're a publicly traded company, so they're forced to. Let's pretend they're not. Let's pretend they're not. A, let's just play. Pretend that they're not forced to, to to do this. Let's just pretend that they they want to do this because because it's important to them. Um, it's important to them because they actually care. They actually care about I think what their customer thinks of them and what the brand means. And they're going to say to those people, whether it's investors, consumers, competition, like we're coming. Be ready. Like you get get ready 
for some cool stuff. And I'm going to tell you that ahead of time so that it starts generating conversations long before we're going to end up actually seeing this stuff. So do you think that like Columbia customers are going to read this article and get excited for this new marketing material coming down the pipeline? Like they're diehard fans. Well, like if I was, if I was, you know, big into hiking and I, they're going to say yes. Um, if you're just an average person who likes a nice coat or a nice pair of, of boots, uh, less so, but there are people in this ecosystem that absolutely care about it. And then we shouldn't forget those people. So like, I'm going to give our, like, I would call them a, call them a VIP, call them whatever. I'm going to make sure they feel so special with this. So beyond this going out in the financial post, so we want to give you the full article. This was probably shared with a whole bunch of people outside of that saying like, watch out. Oh yeah. So this is just one method of them sharing well, this story. And for the leadership of the company, there's all kinds of reasons for them. To do yes. This because like they want their friends who own companies to know that yeah. they're like making smart moves. Yeah. And I want the marketing, Adam and Eve DDB. I want them to feel proud that they want, like this was probably a very competitive bid. Yep. This was not like something that just happened in two days. Like there's going to be, there was pit, there was, there was a lot of work. There was a lot of time spent in doing that well. Um, and they should feel happy about that. So it's kind of like a celebration and a kickoff. And then they're kind of putting, they're kind of putting like a timeline, a line in the sand where they're saying like, now it's official. Yeah. We're now officially doing this thing. And it was a good reason why. And here's what we partnered with and like celebrating that partnership. Like there's so many, there's so many businesses that we see, whether they're small or large, they finally get their product into a store, whether it's like just on consignment or something else, but they don't actually tell people like, hey, we're proud of this. Yeah. Like our, our little small business is growing. We were accepted by X and Y company over there. You can find us over there and the, whatever on the market, on whatever. You should be promoting that partnership more thoroughly. That's half the battle of saying, well, if you haven't tried our product yet, they believe in us. Now, it's they a, think it's, it's good. It's a little more obvious in that example though, right? Because like, oh, my product is in store somewhere else. It's selling over there. There's lots of reasons to promote that mm -hmm. to consumers because that's somewhere you can buy the product. That's social proof that the product is good. Mm -hmm. Like there's lots of benefit to that. But like, you know, if, if one of our clients, brand new client hires us for the first time to um, overhaul their marketing or overhaul their technology, should they be releasing a press release? telling their market that like it depends they're working with a new marketing agency so like yeah if we're saying it makes sense for a company the size of columbia yeah. if we go down down the ladder till we get to the small and medium-sized enterprises at what point does that stop making sense like this would it need to be specifically a press release no but like if you've got an email list if you're if you're active on social media i don't think it's a bad thing to say like here's what to expect out of us for the next quarter Sure. Or here's what here's what we're doing. Here's some transparency into our product roadmap. Or here's like if it was a technology company, we'd say like, here are the features we're working on. They're not ready yet, but like here's what we're we're working on. Here's Again, where your dollars are that's going. That's different though, because that's like that's if it was that's an, a product roadmap. If that's it was like, an agency, here's like, who we're working with with an agency side of the. Like for me personally, if we were if we were the agency, this doesn't add value to your to your um, to your customer base. Saying hey, we're working with Two H Media now, like. Uh, like our brand more? Well, like it it's, might. It, it could. So like it depends. Are, so like a perfect example would be we did a rebrand for Innovation Guelph, right? And we helped them. With oh, yes. List. So that would be, that so would have like, been one that would it, be. In yeah. their case, for them to do a press release saying, hey, we've brought on 2H Media to do, to help us with a rebrand. Yeah. We've got big new things planned. That would be like a really useful step in yes. preparing the audience for the changes that are coming. Yeah. And it would have been an opportunity for some, some cross promotion and like really build each other up. So like I can see clear value there. Um, some of the website jobs, it might make sense. Maybe. Right? Like if this they, depends, if, like if this you've is got like a really old e-commerce store and you're preparing to move to Shopify and you know that your customers are frustrated with the experience of ordering from you now, letting them know some positive changes are coming could be some like worthwhile bugs. Yeah. Um, that's more like product roadmap though. But again, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's more like product roadmap. Um, so like, you know, specifically when it's a marketing related thing, I think it's really tough to find examples where like it makes sense to prime your clients mm -hmm. on that coming ahead of time. It's, it's like, can you use it to generate excitement? Can you show them that you're like reinvesting back into the brand? Like there, there are ways to do that. It, it really depends on the use case at the higher levels. Like it's always good. Yep. to be more transparent from investor down to the VIP people that just adore the brand that are like uh, like ride or die. There's a, a, a right way to do that. Um, a simple press release, again, 
for, from a small business standpoint, if you have good relations with like your local paper or subreddit communities or Facebook groups or things like that, there are, uh, there are opportunities for you to share information like this without it taking three weeks to get the perfect words down sure. for you to do that. So well, can so, you do it so quickly? That Great. actually ties in really nicely to why I put this question in the doc. Yeah. Because I kind of wanted to workshop this live and talk about the transparency mm-hmm. you were mentioning. As an agency, would it make sense for us to build a process for making press releases and social media posts really easy for our clients when they start working on this on a new project? Uh, yeah. Yep. Right? Like, would, yep. It, would, it, would it make sense for us to say, hey, great. You've just started working with 2H Media. Here's a template for a press release mm-hmm. to tell your audience about the cool changes that are coming. Yep. It's not going to cost you as a client anything for us to put that together. Mm-hmm. It's a win-win because we get buzz out of that as well. Um, is that something that would make sense? It for would. A lot of the clients? And again, they would still get the choice. Maybe one they want to keep that hidden. Maybe they're not. There's like if if you, I only see that as a value add, and it's at their discretion. So like, yeah, win. Okay. Yeah, I, I I couldn't. I don't see a downside to that. Period. Like, okay. the, what's the downside to the only allowing downside you? Is to... Like, it's more work if it's not broadly applicable. Uh, yes. Right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um. And but like, if the argument is there that like we have enough use cases where it makes sense, then it makes sense. Like, mm-hmm. the, the Shopify example you were talking about. You know, if moving to an e-commerce platform is a product roadmap thing that is going to have a big impact on people's customers, yeah, maybe they should. Be maybe they should know. Announcing that ahead of time. Um. Then maybe we should make it easy on yep. our customers to get the word out. I like that. I, I can see some value in that for sure. Um, speaking to, of Shopify. Do you want to lead us into the next topic? Look at, look at me doing a segue for, for a change. I know. I'm proud of you. Uh, this might sound like a, a uh, you know, an article out of the Beaverton or something like that. But this is absolutely true. So stick with me to the end. Lack of ambition in Canada creating a 600 pound beaver in the room. Shopify president. Right. The president of e-commerce giant uh, Shopify Inc. wants Canada to address a problem he calls the 600 pound beaver in the room. Harvey Finkelstein says that the problem is a lack of ambition that's permeating the Canadian psyche and weighing down the country's tech sector. He sees that the lack of ambition has left Canadian companies with a reputation for being acquired where their U.S. competitors grow more dominant by taking them over. Finkelstein in, instead wants Canadian companies to focus on striving for more rather than settling for being acquired. He also adds that he wants more companies to be headquartered in Canada rather than the country being treated like a branch plant for bigger organizations. And this comes out of CTV News, and I read this a, a while ago. Um, uh, this is, I firmly agree with this. Most of the most of the um, innovation hubs that we work with, they all have models for acquisition rather than growth. They all have, how do I get you investor ready? How do I get you to do X and Y? Um, now there's nothing wrong with being acquired. If you're able to build a company and sell it for what you're happy with selling it for, congratulations, like good for you. Like round of applause all around. Don't feel bad about you. You are not the 600 pound beaver. You, you did it. You did exactly what you wanted to. You created something, someone else found value in it and you got paid. Good for you. End of story. Well, you know, in the context, you are the 600 pound beaver. Uh, I, because he is complaining about people who do that whether they do it successfully or not i he's against it i have i view this as this is coming from shopify's perspective of well why don't you keep growing and just pay us a little bit it's like well because okay. because i you know i did i met my goals so like could could my could my company you know, continue manufacturing my x and y and then expand into the states and keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, and growing. cool you're, you're, so you're, you're talking about this coming from Shopify because of that it sort of ties into our yeah. third question, which is, is this statement fair coming from the head of one of Canada's biggest success stories? And, and so like, I don't, I don't, re- I don't see the same angle you see. I don't see it as like him speaking on behalf of Shopify saying, oh, grow bigger and keep spending your money with Shopify. I see it as him going like, I built a company. I'm yep. continuing to control that company. We're not looking for a buyout. We're looking to rule the space. They're doing a really good job succeeding that. Yep. But like, is that just survivorship bias? I don't know. There's there's a lot. Like I love Shopify. We work yeah. with it all the time. So like I'm gonna be a little bit critical here. There's a reason why this platform is in U.S. dollars, even though they're a Canadian-based company. If you were to go on their okay. site, that's a really it, fun point. It's I like it's like why do I see U.S.-based pricing the minute I hit the site as a Canadian business? Because like oh like 
like you're you are you yourself are catering to where your audience is coming from and there's a 50 times bigger market a hundred miles that in that direction like why are you not doing it yeah. so like if if it was more and i could come up with more but like if i saw it like genuinely through this i would think less of it we're very close to this we're very very close to this being a few things the canadian digital adoption program was eye-opening there are studies after studies proving that canadian productivity is not accelerating as fast as u.s uh based productivity uh, technology adoption for Canadians is slower than US, the, their equivalent U.S. companies. So, like he he does nail this. Like there is a 600-pound beaver in the room when you can when you're trying to compare apples to apples between U.S. market and Canadian market. There absolutely is. Um, it's a little I, bit rich in some kinds, but know if that's that's fair because you're you're talking about like our quickness to adopt technology and conflating that to like his argument. His argument is not about adoption. His argument is whether you're building to sell or building to. Or building for like, I think it's the psyche around. Itself. I think it's just the psyche around like what, what the culture is in Canada. So like whether it's technology adoption or growing, uh, just, and being scary. Like there's just less. I, I think Canadians think, are a lot of less risk takers than their U.S. counterparts. I just don't think this is a Canadian issue. Oh, you're saying it's just not a Canadian? Okay, I, maybe. I, like, maybe. Like, so like the question number two: Are companies being unambitious by aiming for buyouts? Is this issue limited to Canadian companies? Is it limited to the tech sector? What no, is no, what is no. the number one book? We get recommended any time we talk to someone about our business strategy. Built to sell. Built to sell. No matter who we talk to, that seems to be the one people keep coming back yep, to. Built to sell. Canadians, Americans, everyone recommends it. Yep. Um, when we worked with a larger um, marketing agency consultancy helping us scale, they saw that the U.S. Built to sell. Built to sell. Like, built to sell. Like their entire model was building around a niche, building your company to a point where you can sell, and then moving on to the next thing. Like yep. this is the current wisdom around how to build a business. Yep. Um, so I don't I don't see it as a Canadian issue. I don't see it as a Canadian issue. Sorry, yeah, I never, I never, it's a good question. I was not focusing on it as a Canadian issue. Now, you know, maybe we have to get out of our own social circle. We got some big social circles. Like I would say it's a very broad, it's not like we're, like what you said about the book, that's not just coming from one person. That's, yeah, that's, that's like a lot of a data bunch. points. Yeah, a bunch. So I'm like, not enough to have like, oh, studies have shown. Like yeah, built a cell. It's on the shelf back right there. Like there's yeah. lean startup built a cell. Like it's there. It's, it's, it's literally two feet behind me. Um, so they're like, and there's great advice in that book. Productize, you know, like, fine. Well, and building a company to sell is a really smart thing to do. If you're building a company with no idea what your long-term vision is, you're gonna have other problems. You're gonna have some problems. So like, you should be building to sell, or you should be building to generate generational wealth. Yeah. There, but you should know which one you're doing, and you should like have a plan to focus do on that thing. It is. I think this does come from some sentiment going like he's kind of coming at this like pro Canada, like like do it, guys. Like, you you can. We see it. They get all the back end data there going like you can absolutely strive for bigger things, be more ambitious. Um, you you can do that. So like these might be words of wisdom saying like, hey, like we I would love for Shopify to come out with an accelerator to compete with all the other accelerators and say like, well, once you hit this specific thing, like we're going to instead of when you hit this milestone, instead of the sell option, why doesn't Shopify offer you a thing where it's like, and I mean, well, I mean obviously it doesn't like, even have to be Shopify specifically, but like Finkelstein, put your money where your mouth is. Start a, start an accelerator. I would love like a Y Combinator, like right see, in Ottawa. But I would, I would like, love to see him build an accelerator, like you say, specifically built around companies getting to the next zero, not built to sell. Yeah. Right? If, he, if, yeah. His, if his niche was an accelerator for yeah. companies that want to generate and maintain wealth, I think that would be brilliant. I don't... I might have to do some research after this. I don't think there's a single accelerator in a Canada that focuses on that period. It's all about all the ones that I've seen, and I'll name them out. I could name them out easy. They are always about fundraising and getting to an acquisition. There's not a single one... It's either like go to market, it's like the early stage startups or go to market, yep. pre-revenue stuff. And then as soon as they've got that, it's like, how do you get acquired? Because like, that's how they get paid. Yeah. It's like, okay, great. We're going to put you, we're going to match you some banks and some lenders and some VCs and yada, yada, yada. It's like, there's nobody there focusing on businesses to not do that. It's interesting. It's like the only person that gets paid in that, in that scenario is actually the business owner and their employees. And like, great, you're just going to continue building it rather than rather than letting a VC come in and give you some money and then get acquired, like, so, but I don't think there's a single accelerator that is focusing on that. So like, Finkelstein, 
what, know? what's up, man? Let's yeah. let's do it. Give me. Well, it's like, <laughs> it's like let's see. Yeah, is you this, could. Is he, this survivorship bias? Well, if you think it's repeatable. Yeah. I would love to see. Or like, I, I would love, I would love even Finkelstein to go a step further, saying instead of that book, instead of Built to Sell, read these five other ones. Yeah. Well, and so this brings me to like my number one discussion topic of this article. Why is this news? Um, well, it's coming out of the Shopify president, so like it's still like one of Canada's biggest, so like biggest and most successful, like in, t- in terms of like companies coming out of Canada, like they've like all time. This has got to be like in the top five: BlackBerry, Shopify. And Nortel, like, Nortel it's came and went. Company, like, it's a big company. So like, this was from a speech he gave at a tech conference. He was on stage with a break dancer. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, like, why? Why is it news? I mean, he's trying. I, I think he's trying to get a message out there to say like, believe in yourself, or maybe he's trying to like advocate for others, saying like, okay, there's a. I, I like hearing. And t- CEOs are typically very good at this. They are problem solvers. They have to present themselves. They have to present themselves as like, here's the challenge that we're facing. Here's how we're actually overcoming it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he laid out a problem, uh, but I didn't hear him come out with like, here are the things that you should do to overcome that problem. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're supporting. Here's he just kind of laid it out, saying like, there's a big, there's an elephant in the room, a beaver, a Canadian beaver. I like, I, I, I do know, like to that. Be fair, to be fair, we are responding to the press coverage yep. of his speech. Yep. I have not read the full transcript. I, I have not watched the speech. I watched it way back when. I didn't read it, but I watched it. Um, and and this is back when there was productivity things going on with like U.S. productivity versus Canadian productivity. This this came after the uh, news that the Canadian digital adoption program was closing down. This came this came down after a few things, and like this is still a problem where. You know, the, the, he's seeing it. Uh, obviously, he's seeing it with a lot more information than we have, because like the the data that Shopify collects is just enormous. Um, so, like, I, I think he's he's trying to bring up a, a problem. Maybe he's trying to say like, hey, there's an opportunity here for helping these people or believing yourself or there there is survivorship bias with 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 a lot of success cuz it's like people always ask well what did you do to become successful it's like well well now they focus on their health and now they're focused on managing it's like before when they were like in the garage startup working 16 hours a day for 3 years straight there was no there was no anything there so there's a lot of people that when they get the option to say okay well, here's what my actual hard work is is worth there's a lot of people that just take it there's a lot of people that are happy with that number like holy Moly, that's more money than I've ever seen in my oh, yeah. whole world. Like yada yada yada. This is true of Shopify. The founder gave it over to a CEO to say, "I'm going to step out. I'm going to IPO it. I'm going to get paid. We're going to keep it in Canada. Great. It's it's publicly owned now. So like it's there's a lot of it is owned by non. It's like it's not owned. It's operated out of Canada." Um, but yeah, he, the, the owner had to step aside and they brought in a, they brought in like a formal CEO and that's hard for people. And that's, so I do, th- I do believe that that 600 pound beaver exists. We've seen it ourselves. People that that's what we're taught. I think there's an educational component to this. Like that's just what people are taught to do. Um, so when you say the 600 pound beaver exists, do you mean as a Canadian thing or just like, I don't know that. Yeah. Like, I, I just, like that's again. that's the hard bit. Like I don't know if it's, I don't I don't know if it's a Canadian thing. I I just know it's a thing. Okay. That like there is a lot of money in the states to acquire businesses. There are entire business strategies where they're just going out and buying film studios, buying productions. You can see this across the board. Whether it's an Am- Amazon gobbling up, G- Disney gobbling up stuff, has like every every big company they have an acquisitions department that is just going out there. And that's part of their growth strategy, so it's going to happen. And what they put money at, they're typically pretty good at. So, so great. Um, and I think there might be like if you're sitting in a room with someone saying, "We're going to pay you this," or "We're going to start developing ourselves and go to war with you." It's like I don't want to go to war with the big guy because like there's a chance I lose, and like sure. I've put a lot of money into this. So it's like, am I forced to sell? But back to what you said, going like, is this a Canadian thing? Um, I couldn't say. Is it a, is it happening in the UK? Is it happening in France? Is well, it happen, is they, they just, the same thing? I don't know. I just don't like saying the beaver in the room is real when it's not. If it's not a Canadian issue, then it's not a Canadian. I think he, well, he was like, he was he was talking to a Canadian audience, so like I think he was trying to make it more 
like suitable for the actual audience that he was talking in front of. But, but it says right in the article, he says, lack of ambition has left Canadian companies with a reputation for being acquired. I, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think Canadian people are very ambitious. I think there is a ton of people that take the risk at starting small businesses. I, I definitely don't think it's an ambition thing. I definitely think it's more confidence than ambition. When you get to a certain skill that you are in deep water, you never thought you'd get here, you're making money, now you're talking to like, there's, there you get, it can be stressful. Um, it's not for the lack of ambition that Canadian companies are, are not taking it to the next level. They are, they are maybe not confident to take it to the next level, but like well, they're, they've already done the hardest it, bit of the like, work. Ambition might be the right word because building a company to sell is less ambitious than building a company than building to, a company that's supposed to turn into this empire that makes you money forever. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. It, like that, that could. That could. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the argument that building to sell is less ambitious than building for generational wealth. I'm just arguing that this is like the conventional wisdom we hear. It is all over the world, and that this is like, this is yeah. nothing to do with like Canada is not going to build a reputation for falling behind by doing the same thing everyone else is doing. No. No. Like we, I have some of like the biggest name, like I, like Sleemans did this. Yeah. They're like, I, like, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's tech, whether it's like, you, you could, you could name this and it's like, well, wh how many millions do you need before it's like, that's just a good deal. Yeah. This is like, this is it. Like, wh what do you mean? Like not every single company is going to turn out to be Google. You're going to hit a ceiling somewhere. Not every company, like there's, there's, there's only like the top 10. So like you're eventually going to get acquired by someone or you can say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to have this a family business and we're going to own the plumbing business forever. And it's going to be multi-generational. There's nothing wrong with well, that. Then, like, what do you do if the kids don't want to run the family business? Like you can sell, sell it to employees. You can, you know, try and get a competitor to buy it. You can do a lot. You can do a lot of things, but, but, but typically it's a sale. Yeah. It's not like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, keep this thing going forever and ever and ever. That's that a lot of businesses that are built right now. And I think that maybe it's just a little, a little bit of a flash in the pan. There's a lot of like get rich quick or like, Oh, we're going to, you, you're going to want to do this because it's passive income. And it's like not a business. It's like that. Those aren't, those aren't like reliable things that you should do. They're not you, you building your drop shipping business ain't quite the same thing as you manufacturing a product and putting a brand on it and going out and actually getting in front of your customers, you are a middleman. And there's there are businesses that are, the, the, that's perfectly fine, but it's different. A trend we've seen over and over and over again in with the business we work with is a lot of the most successful and most well-to-do business owners we work with are people that inherited successful businesses from yep. their parents and from yep. their parents' parents. And those tend to be businesses where there is a manufacturing component, a large warehousing component, um, large scale infrastructure that gets carried with it to the next generation. Yep. Um, and it's something that the like the built to sell businesses yep. don't tend to have because they're built to be agile and built to be capable of being swallowed up and moved very quickly. So it's definitely different. Yeah. So like, yeah, this is like a I'm trying to read between the lines here. Plus, also remember, like I, I watched, I watched it live. This is like, this is like a while ago now. But this is uh, not that long ago. This article came out the beginning of October. Yeah, so not that long ago. Still, um, I don't want to just rely on my memory when I'm doing this. But um, I would love to see. Like, I mean, obviously, Shopify is a lot of like you know people. It is nice to say Shopify is a Canadian success story. Do we need more of them? I would love to have 50 other names. Yeah that are doing that, right? And I would love that, I would love for the people that do have money in Canada to say, okay, great. Like, I mean, I watch uh, Dragon's Den. Yep. Like, I, I love seeing Canadian investment in companies and great, 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 and scale them up. I'd love to see more of those those wins happening. Uh, really hard to do. Yeah. Really, really, really hard to do. Um, and again, it's a difficult choice for a, like a CEO or a, or a founder to, to not to walk away from money when it's right there. Like, that's like crazy. That, like, that, that can be seen as great. Why wouldn't you just do that? That you're set for life kind of thing. It's like, well, I had to have that that goal from day one and not to not sell, yeah. to tell them where to go to, to build it out. So um, 
I would love uh, to go back um, and read because obviously this this would have happened to Shopify as well when they were developing their product. They were probably approached for acquisition more than once. And how did those discussions go during their development and their their uh, their growth? Um, and, and how they and navigated those. Shopify is the best e-commerce platform, bar none. Bar none. In my opinion, like, yeah. it is it is phenomenal. Um, yeah. If I could put all of our clients on Shopify, I would. Even the ones that don't sell a product. Yeah. Because it is such a fantastic. Uh, platform to work with when building websites. It's phenomenal. And I can't confidently say that the platform would be in the positive place that it is today if they had taken a buyout early in their development yep. and become a branch of who knows. Just Amazon. <laughs> like like any anyone else. The, well, the Amazon could have bought to shut it down. Well I like mean, they a, could... any of the any given tech conglomerate yep. that starts as a CRM and adds work management. Yeah, Salesforce buys it. On, or... um, <laughs> Employee yeah. scheduling and tax yeah. on like the next technology. World school buys the next it. Technology yeah. and they don't speak to each other well. Like we see so many of these groups of Frankenstein's monster of technology solutions. Um, it's really nice when you've got something a that's built piece of technology. And we've the job. we've seen this like we've we've been to Shopify's offices. Their employees like we've we've seen the the inner workings of it. It's incredible. Um, and yeah, I would love to have more Canadian success stories. I don't think there's a single Canadian that would that would disagree with that. Um, so yeah, he's trying to say yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it's rich coming from the guy at the top. Yeah, it is. It's like it's like holy geez, like yeah, celebrate the the wins, but also like you know there there's a there's a a building up component that I think Canadians like, should be better at striving for, like believing in your neighbor and things like that and supporting the business down the street so um i think that's where this article rubs me the wrong way is that it that's feels me. it feels like there's an element of condescension to it and like it's yeah it's it's like it's punching down a little it, if that uh, makes sense yeah um and then it's not substantive enough to feel like it should have been picked up that's where i'm trying to like defend it but at the same time i get the same vibe it's like yeah. it's like what well, we, we want to defend it because we love shopping i know i know and and like i do and want Shopify businesses to succeed so like i just think yeah. it was maybe the wrong words or well, so or, I think or something you hit the nail on the head when you said this like what are the five books we should read what? To follow up on. So you, you right. say this, yeah, and then here's the solution. The CEO has got to present like some options for that. And I don't, again, testing memory, I don't think that was available. I don't think there was any follow up to, to saying like, you know, uh, uh, when he says, uh, when he, again, when he says lack of ambition, he's got to come up with like, here's how you become more ambitious. Here's what you should be doing. Here's what you should uh -huh. be striving for. Here's what you should want. And, and here's why. Yeah. Like great layout problem, fifteen solutions. We love it, and then then you can take this article and it doesn't feel like it's punching down. Yeah, it it feels like it's a resource now. Believe in yourself. Here's how to do it. Cool, but so there's like some good takeaways here. Like I would love to have those books. I would love to see if those even exist. Building the next, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of buildings out there that took a hundred years to build, and they're still around. So, cool. Um, anything else on that? No, man. I think we've covered all the broad points. Um, interesting. Interesting. Interesting statement to have a conversation around. Yeah. Love everything Shopify is doing. Hands down. Um, if you resonated with anything we talked about today, if you need someone to take a look at the technology you're using, um, or if you need help with your marketing, I would encourage you to book a free strategy session with one of our experts. We'll take the time to get to know your business, develop a plan that makes sense for you, and answer your burning questions so that you can move forward with clarity and confidence. Uh, if that sounds impactful, then book a strategy session. And in the meantime, thanks for watching.